Welcome to the Cosmetic Podcast. This podcast amplifies the topics you want to hear about. Cosmetic means being a person or thing that gives rise to a phenomenon that is dynamic or energizing. Globally minded and locally focused. I'm Rodrigo Ross. I'm Keith Benson. So today we are talking about, or our subject is, my lips are sealed. Please? Can, no, can we... no, don't. It's too early. We just started. We okay. just started. I'm sorry. No. We are talking specifically about the consequence of silence by white people around racial justice, right? So let me frame this up. The University of Vermont did a study, right? And they ascertained that white silence, this whole idea of white silence, is experienced by white people who, during discussions around racial issues, um, when they experience negative of emotions, they just clam up, right? And they get quiet and they don't talk about it and they resist engaging in conversations in certain content areas. And so that resistance, that inability to talk about it and work through those emotions that they're feeling, whether it's guilt or anger, is called white silence. Uh, I was having a discussion with a gentleman and he has stated, and I think we talked about this in one of our previous podcasts around they didn't really have the conversation around racial type things with their children right. or in the in the family. Yeah. And it's like it almost has a sense of avoidance, right? Like yeah. how do you avoid a crucial conversation mm-hmm. such as that right there, which is gonna impact not only you, your family, but it is here in the world. It's on the news, it's on your sitcoms, it's on your movies. Yeah. It, I mean it's on everything. Can't avoid like, it. How do you avoid that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, I think in in some regards that is a privileged behavior because there are absolutely populations, right? Like black people who can't afford to not have that conversation conversation in their family or with their children. They they have to start talking about racial is- issues and racial justice issues, but the fact that, you know, there are some white people who who take liberty in saying, "Well, no, we just won't talk about it. We won't deal with it. We'll just quiet it up." Um, because that's their way of dealing with their levels of discomfort. We have to get past that if we want to have some true change and reconciliation happening um, in this country. There was this powerful march, though, on July 28th, 1917. There was 10,000 African-American men, women, and children. They marched in silence wow. through the streets of uh, your city. Of course. In New York City. Which is hard to be silent. Yeah. <laughs> but this was in protest to lynching in America. Mm-hmm. You know, it was considered one of the first public demonstrated uh, African-American um, protests of the 20th century. Wow. And uh, this was in NAACP. They mobilized these thousands of uh, people to be able to march through the street. And it was called the Negro Silent Protest Parade. Mm-hmm. And it was down Fifth, Fifth Avenue. Nice. So mm-hmm. that was the, a time where the silence probably had really spoke volumes. Right. Because you had that many people uh, protesting and peace, peaceful protesting. Pre- yes. And, you know, in some regards, if you think about the time in which the protest happened, that probably was a safeguard, right? Like, they wanted to protest, they wanted to bring attention, but what you're talking about 1917, what were the consequences if they were not silent? 10,000 African-American men, women, and children in one place just walking down the street, and, and, and then you add on this layer of loud and disruptive, they, they might not have had the privilege. Because when you come to the workplace... <clears throat> And you bring that silence there, and we're not addressing those things. Yeah, we get this same mundane work, especially nonprofit mm-hmm. type of work, the work that we do day in and day out, where we're trying to impact community while we're doing good things, but we're not say, talking about those tough issues, those critical, having those critical conversations that are out there. Yeah, and that makes it really tough for other minorities within your organization to uh, just like to comprehend, like how come nobody is saying anything right. about the elephant that's in the, in the room. room. And you start to think, am I the only one? Like, is there something wrong with me? Like, I know someone else is noticing or feeling or or dealing with this, right? And so on top of the silence, there are also some, some, some dismissive, like, slogans and phrases that people use sometimes to protect their ability to stay silent or to perpetuate their ability to be silent. Like, oh, well, you know, I don't discuss such matters because I feel like this nation is a melting pot. Yeah. So we're all cheese now. <laughs> what? 
this is not the time to be no, silent. Silence not. is that seed from which deceit and hatred grows. Yes, because nobody really understands your intentions because you won't tell them. And this stuff just, you, people make up stuff in their heads, right? And it's probably not at all what you were thinking or what you were intended, but how are we supposed to know that? Right. We was silent. Like, we got to get this. We got to get this out. We got to have these conversations. Yeah. We can't just not talk about things. Yeah. yeah. So Martin Luther King has a, a famous quote, and I'm probably going to butcher the quote exactly. But basically, it's saying that in times of strife, I will not remember what my enemies did. I will remember the silence of mm. my so-called friends, right? Ooh. Because you expect your enemies Ooh. to do something, but then you also have that same expectation of people who call themselves your allies and your friends and your accomplices or co-conspirators or what have you. You expect them to kind of jump up and be vocal on your side. And when they're standing silent, it, it, it almost seems like, oh, so you're with them. This is okay to you. And they may be grappling with it, right? But right, how right. are we supposed to know that? So I was working with this group, and um, this group has first-time African-American um, uh, chair of a board. Mm-hmm. And the major- he was the only one. He was the only the second. He was one of two that were on the board. Mm-hmm. So in the history at this time, it was 50-year-old organization. I had two African-Americans on the board, period. Wow. And so I was talking to um, his daughter, who was kind of coaching him in terms of how, how to lead, you know, child leading, the, leading, the, you know, well, leading. Go the ahead, yeah. daughter. Right, I like right. It. And I was asking, so I was saying, well, who's some of the allies on the board? And she would begin to name two or three. I said, well, what have the allies said, you know, out in public? Well. They haven't said anything mm. publicly, but they told him that, you know, hey, whatever you do, oh, I, I got your back. Doors. And mm-hmm. I'm like, mm-hmm. I don't need you to be talkative one on one to me. Right. I need your voice. In the, in the spaces <laughs> that I don't have access right. to. And where yes. the decisions are being yes, made. Indeed. So when we're sitting around this table, oh. I need your voice to be here. Speak up, speak up, speak up. Yes, and you know, many people can misinterpret that silence, right? And then for the folks who are silent, I can imagine that that, that misinterpretation can, can be kind of unnerving. But many people can misinterpret that silence as you outwardly saying, I don't care enough about this situation to get uncomfortable and speak out. And if that's not what you're trying to say, then you might want to speak out because that's what people are gleaning from silence. And then as a leader, when you get to that point, you're speaking out, making sure you educate yourself, making sure you understand, you know, what is going on around there and then making sure that you are walking the talk. Mm. So that Mm -hmm. walking the talk means that when you're alone, and you are not in the public eye. Yeah. Like you still need to be walking right because yeah. you never know yeah. when that camera is on you. Yeah. It, you know, the the other thing that you have to do if if people are being silent about something that is really affecting your lived experience, right? Like racism or classism or sexism or something. You have to push people to speak without necessarily putting words in their mouth. Like, I'm not going to tell you what to say, but I'm going to steer you down because you have to say something like this has to be a team approach like we have to stop letting people off the hook right. and 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 giving them excuses or you know using grace as the qualifier to say oh it's all right they're uncomfortable will and like no you have to push people you have to help me help you help me let me understand right help, you, help, help me, me yeah, to help. help you to help me okay can we do that and then there's a time that you got to invest right yeah. invest in putting your money where your mouth is mm-hmm. like corporations and leaders we got to be able to put money into we can't just uh, make a statement and leave it there it's like how do we weave all of that and so when we're talking yeah. about investing our money paying vendors like what is what does that look like in terms of our vendor list that we have what does that look like for for-profit organizations where they can now give back to the community where are you putting your, your money at yeah 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 and and please don't don't hear me saying that you know silent 
violence is completely intolerable because we know that some people, especially like if if you're in a conversation and and some subject matter comes up and it just hits you right then and you don't say anything in the moment, right? Because you're trying to process. Like people process differently. It's fine. You know, if any of us have ever been in a meeting, you know the people who are going to always have something to say right there on the spot. And then you have the people that later on it kind of coalesces and it comes together and they definitely have some profound thoughts about it. So when we're talking about silence, white silence, we're not talking about just situational, right? right. We're, we're talking about about a concept overall. Like, we recognize that sometimes you may be dealing with emotions or, or dealing with subject matter right in the moment that requires you to just quietly process. But after that process, it is over. Somebody has to say something, right? right? And that's the disconnect. Like, you took all that time to process and then you still didn't say anything. And like, this- we don't know where you stand with this. Right. And this conversation is not about because you're an introvert and you don't speak up. Right. This is not about no. you know, my, my co-host here. You I know, am. Tell it. It's true. Y'all can hear Tell it. it's true. that that you that she believes that she's <laughs> she's an introvert. Is, I am an introvert. Yes, ma'am. I I, yes, yes. America <laughs> believes is that. So true. Yeah. You know. But huh. so this is when we're talking about speaking up, we're talking about when you have that opportunity to be in a position to make decisions, to have a voice in the place of uh, decisions and things that are going on in the community or in your corporation or your nonprofit, whatever the case may be, it's at a time that you got to interject uh, what is right in yeah, there. Yeah. And um, being able to address, like we said earlier, that elephant that's in the room. Yeah, so I will tell you, I had an experience with this not too long ago. So I had, uh, I was in a meeting, one of our regular standing meetings with a group of people that we regularly meet with. And, um, you know, we were in the meeting and for whatever reason, the conversation kind of shifted towards something about race or social justice or whatever the case may be. Having a very intelligent conversation. And while the people that were in the meeting, I never thought of them and cer- certain people specifically. I never really thought of them as being racist. I, I can say if I'm going to be completely transparent that I, I I couldn't say with a high degree of certainty that they weren't, right? And I think that's the mm. problem that messed with me a little bit. It was like, I don't really want to call them racist, but I'm not 100, 100, 100% sure that they're really not. And then in one particular conversation, this particular conversation, one of those people just said out their mouths, look, I, I, I am not a racist. I know that I, I benefit from white privilege. I, I want to learn more. I want to do more. But, you know, I'm at a loss of, of what to do sometimes. Sometimes, and I promise, just that little bit, that that opening up and that clarifying, um, really changed my perception of that person and how we engage, and you know what resources I offer them, and and what things we talk about. And this is not a person that I've just met. I've known this person, working mm. with them closely for at least fifteen years, and that was the first time I had ever heard it come out of their mouths. And and that's when this whole idea of white silence really got profound for me. It's like, now I know unequivocally what this person stands for because I heard it out of their mouths. Whereas before, I, you know, I was trying to give them the benefit of the doubt and I was I was making that assumption. Yeah, here recently um, had a conversation. We just a uh, organic deal. Um, we had about five of us on the call and all different races and we're just having a conversation and everybody was just being frank. Mm-hmm. You know, hey, here's where I am on, you know, this issue. Uh, here's where I am on that issue. And it really helped to bring Break down this barrier of a wall mm-hmm. that you know that people just felt re- relieved just to have yeah. conversation about yeah. you know that you know those big those big topics that are out there. Yeah, and nobody blew up. There wasn't guts on the screen. No. Did somebody break down and cry and you couldn't put them back together? Yeah. Was anybody committed to yeah. any institutions? No, nah, but that? It, it was. Like- it, and it was. It was refreshing <laughs> for me, and it wasn't so much that they had a thousand questions for Keith because he's a black male, yeah. but it was just general conversation about specific topics that um, related to we're talking about bias o- overall mm. and it was just it was it was healthy um, yeah. because we started off to be a 30 minute conversation we ended up 
been about an hour. And we said at the end is that, hey, we're not we said at the beginning that we're not trying to come to some solution here, Mm -hmm. but we want to just have some open dialogue. And at the end result of that conversation, it was, man, how do we continue to do this? Not so much to create a formal plan, but just how do we now have conversations? So the charge went out was that now each one of us up here, how do you go now to set up another call Mm. to have conversation with With another group of people? Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then one and then one, you know, this whole idea of courageous conversations, right? The setting up this space, creating the environment so that we can combat white silence. We can talk to folks about what happens or what we experience or how things stay the same or, or change when white people um, are silent is really based on this whole idea of trust, right? So Stephen mm-hmm. Covey wrote this book called The Speed of Trust, which I think is a great book. And I've had that book for forever and ever. And I, I regularly go back and pull bits and pieces out of it. But at its core, it's really talking about don't discount um, that trust probably lies at the core of many functions that we probably thought were something else. So, you know, you're thinking about courageous conversations. You want to create the space. You invite the diverse people. You have a, a great topic. Yeah, but if you don't do something to create this trust, right, and how quickly do you get people to trust one another and what do you have to do to to create these levels of trust then you you won't be able to combat this thing and I absolutely believe that white silence is is gonna take the marriage of creating these courageous conversation spaces but white people are going to have to trust that they will make it through the process that they are resolved and resilient enough to take whatever comes out of that and learn and get past their discomfort and whoever else they're talking to whether it's about race or class or whatever has to trust that this person is being the most genuine and authentic version of themselves and that everybody is is moving towards some kind of um solution yeah it's just critical right now that our leaders just engage in the issue around racism and discrimination. Yeah. That's going to help change our, our workforce. It's going to help present um, better opportunities for a lot of individuals Absolutely. that are out there. And Absolutely. So, I mean, lots going on in our in our society with this conversation right here. Yeah. I'm excited to uh, just be able to have this right here. But I want to thank uh, Jody Newman. She's Yay, one of Jody. Our, our listeners. And uh, Jody, thank you for bringing this to our attention uh, as a Love topic Jody. to be able to discuss on uh, Causenetic. So thank you all for uh, listening to Causenetic. Where our conversations are global. Local. Globally minded and locally focused. Give us some feedback at ymcadallas.org slash cosmetic and tell us what you think organizational leaders or any white person should do to help fight white silence. And as always, stay dynamic, stay energized, stay cosmetic. <laughs>